Good evening. Welcome. My name is Stephen Norper. I'm the Senior Vice President here at the Korea Society, and we are so thrilled to uh, have Marja here this evening, uh, as well as Eric and David, and to have all of you for the kickoff to our late spring summer season. You'll see this is the first event listed uh, of many really interesting events that take place over the coming few months. We'd also like to point out the presence of His Excellency Kim Yong-mok, uh, the Council General, of Korea to the United States. Ambassador, thank you for coming tonight. And we're going to uh, begin before bringing uh, Marsha, uh, Eric, and David to the stage uh, with the trailer for this really wonderful series. And you'll hear more about uh, the Sunday showing on Channel 13 and PBS. And uh, we'll talk a lot more in coming minutes. Thank you for coming. Kim Ji-soon is a Julia child of Jeju-do. She was going to show my sauerkraut and pork loving husband how to make mumguk, a stew made from pork, seaweed, and year-old kimchi. Yeah, what well, is this kimchi? Yeah, kimchi. Well, chopped and... It goes in the soup yeah. as well. How old is that kimchi? Last year. Last year, last, last year. year yeah. So it's last year kimchi. And you can tell, you can tell the, the color of kimchi changes. You know, the, when it's fresh, the, the cabbage is very white on, with the mm. chili. And then as it gets older, it gets a little more yellow. melting yellow. Yeah. And now we're going to add uh, the pork stomach, scallion, the last year kimchi. Yeah. On the seaweed. seaweed. Wow, look at that. Amazing. Last year kimchi, she said. Last year kimchi. So, so what Miss Kim did. Mm. So it's like uh, a whole well, kimchi. This is actually last year's kimchi. Is it? I've been hiding it. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I'm going to just add a little bit of juice here. All right, so I got you hooked on kimchi juice, huh? Absolutely. And then, uh, which I love about <laughs> that dish is really combining uh, the sea on the earth. The nice seaweed in there. So chopped up as well. Mm hmm. I need to take out the, the pork belly. Here we are. Look at this. Beautiful. So kimchi, one year old, seaweed. There you go. Uh, yeah, simmer for 20 minutes. We want the seaweed to be super soft. Not from soft. That looks delicious. It tastes like, uh, yeah, instead of a cabbage on pork, it's like a seaweed on pork. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my god. Oh, oh, oh. Very hot, be careful. Wow. It's amazing. Yes. Stomach? Yes. Wow. Very nice. Delicious. Wow. <laughs> How about the sushi? Machine? Machine. 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 Here we go. I think I have a pretty good texture. That looks so good. Never had cabbage and um, seaweed together. So then I'll give a little twist to Mrs. Kim uh, pork belly. Nice and uh, crispy. Beautiful. All right, well now I'm gonna show you my favorite uh, cabbage pork soup. It's called kimchi chige. One of my favorite places in Korea does their kimchi chige in seven minutes. Seven minutes? And they're famous for it. Oh, oh my God, this is the magic coming. This is seven minute kimchi chige, which is amazing because I boil my kimchi chige for like 30 minutes. I don't know how they do it. You know what's so important about Korean cooking? I find the heat. Everything is boiled, steamed, 
stir fried or grilled. Right. The salted seaweed just adds a little something extra to it. Look at that. Is that Ooh. not perfection in a spoon? <laughs> Let's check mine. Yep, mine's done. Beautiful. It's there. Looks amazing. Mm, it smells good too. Beautiful. And I do my last little garnish. The this kim? is called Kim, but it's uh, seasoned dry seaweed laver. Wow. And it tastes good in here. Okay, so which soup do you want to try first? I'll try your one. Oh, good kim choice. Chicken. Wow, this is so delicious. It's a good compliment to mm. kimchi. Try yours now. This is delicious. Mmm. Oh yeah, the kimchi seaweed combo is nice. It's got a really good spice though. It's like perfectly balanced. Babe, this is pretty darn perfect. Okay, so um, I'm Dave Kim, uh, founder of the uh, Korean American Film Festival in New York, and uh, we have Marja Von Richten and Eric Ree, uh, part of the Kimchi Chronicles. Uh, very excited to have you guys here. Um, it's very exciting to see uh, Korean food taking kind of a main stage in a, on a place such as PBS. Um, I mean, how did you guys even, you know, come to know each other, get to, you know, be involved in this project together from the get-go? This is Eric's baby. So I'll let him start. So you know. The it's story become better. my baby as well, but. So you know the story better. Yeah. Okay, you're going <laughs> to. The dinner, the dinner that we had. Or the okay, so um, I, Eric was having dinner with our uh, executive, uh, our producer, Charlie Pinsky, at John George. And um, I happened to be there with Hugh Jackman just doing like a family Friday night dinner, mm -hmm. you know, like people do with Wolverine. <laughs> um, so <laughs> and um, so my husband took me to meet Eric and Charlie, who he's known for quite a while. Um, and they just happened to be discussing this Korea project. So I spoke my little bit of Korean and greeted Eric. And um, Charlie, I guess, was just mesmerized by my presence and called JG next day and um, asked if I'd be interested in hosting this series. And then, you know, through talking with him, my story came out in my connection. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just kind of been a natural thing, you know? I mean, basically, it was a decision between using a Korean-American chef and Mar I don't know if everybody knows Marge's story, but it, it's an incredible story of really, um, like the true Korean-American spirit, somebody born in Korea but yet um, gets adopted and then finds a family. And I think a lot of us Korean-Americans have that issue, not just necessarily with adoption, but just finding our own identity. And this show is really about her identity and finding people through food and you know, over any other chef that I've met, I, I thought, you know, we thought that Marja was the best kind of storyteller for this series. And um, her passion for food and obviously her connection to food made it kind of, you know, the next day Charlie and I were talking, we said, you know what, let's just do it with Marja because it makes the most amount of sense. So um, at the end of the day, um, her story made our story even better. So that, that's kind of how the story happened. And, and that's, what, that's what Kimchi Chronicles is really about is telling your story about about Korean food, about Korean culture, and and we'll, we'll talk about this later. But I think Korean Kimchi Chronicles is just a movement to start people to get to talk about their own Korean experiences, right. whether you're Korean or not. And and I think Marja starts that movement with her story with this with with our series. So, yeah, that, I mean that really appealed to me a lot. About uh, I I got a chance to watch the uh, the first episode, and uh, you know it's more than just food. You know it's just food as an entree into getting to know. Uh, people, you know, I think, I mean, for myself too, I mean, I'm a big foodie. Whenever I go somewhere, it's all about like food first, you know, and then right. that's how I get to really like a place. If they don't have good food, then I'm just kind of bummed out. I want to right. leave, you know. Exactly. Um, but uh, I mean, was it, I mean, it looks like you're, you're having a lot of fun on this trip, and uh, I mean, was it smooth sailing all the way, or? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> the TV production. Um, no, it wasn't smooth sailing. I mean, I think the main reason was uh, there was just so many stories out there, and we couldn't fit everything into the time that we had. It was the hard part was filtering. Yeah. You know, 
Um, and I, we're both biased. We know Korea, but to, to figure out what would be the most important for people to understand, to filter out all the stories that I've been exposed to and, and find out what would be the most interesting to Americans, mm -hmm. that's the hardest part. Um, I mean, you know, waking up early, you know, 6 a.m., 5 a.m. to go to fish market, that's hard. I mean, it's hard for me. <laughs> but really, the, the hardest part of the production is trying to narrow it into 13 episodes, 30 minutes, because we shot over 200 hours of footage, and we had to turn that into, you know, less than six, minutes well, six, hours, <laughs> six, hours, six hours of footage. Right. And well, how did you kind of make that choice? Like, what kind of, um, I don't know, structure or format were you thinking you had to, you know, make these 13 episodes? Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> so each episode is broken down by um, a food group or a food ingredient. So we have an episode on beef. We have an episode on noodles. We have an episode on rice. We have an episode on beans. Uh, beans. And so each episode is in inspired by a Korean ingredient or a dish um, that's used commonly in Korean food. And um, except for the intro show, most of the episodes are basically inspired by, hey, what's the best place to get noodles? What's the best place to get karbi? What's the best place to get doenjang jjigae or kimchi jjigae? And as you saw in the preview clip, the best place to get kimchi jjigae is this place that makes it in seven minutes, at least for us. And that's my favorite place. And that's my go-to that's place. That's what she does when she gets to Korea. And the first thing she eats after she lands is this seven-minute kimchi jjigae. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we kind of pick our story. We, and then we also got some local recommendations from you know, people who've been going to restaurants for years and years. And so um, you know, it's a combination of what we thought was good for Americans and then what Korean people thought was their favorite. Uh, in their country, so. Um, were you pre pretty successful finding great places in this way, or did you come up upon a few places that turned out to be duds, or? No, I don't think we ever had a dud, but Eric did all the footwork. He was oh. there probably six weeks before we All right, so you're checking arrived, out to make sure. So the only there. dud was like, I went to McDonald's one time. Oh, stop cause, it. Because I was, I was, I was so <laughs> wanting a hamburger, and there's no, really in, in, in what Korea. What about Krause Burger? The best lunch we had when yeah. we were watching the uh, traditional dancers. In the we had the subway sandwiches. Oh, we had subway sandwiches. Oh, subway sandwiches. <laughs> because when you're traveling, I mean, this is if you ever go abroad and and you're abroad and you eat the country's food for like a month. But excuse me, I'm eating it six, seven times a day. Yeah. So I'm like, you know. And uh, nine in the morning. And and we eat it with her. But at the end of the day, if you're American, you're like, you know what? I want a, I want a hamburger or I want a sandwich because. Right. That doesn't exist for us in our in our in our diet when we're on the road because we're always going to Korean restaurants, but. Um, if you ever travel, you'll always feel like, you know what, I want something American. I just wanted yeah. to bite, just a little. So I had my, I mean, literally I had a Big Mac, a Whopper, and <laughs> a cold cut trio all in Korea. And those are some of my most memorable meals because <laughs> I wanted it so bad. So. <laughs> all right. Um, so, you know, you were saying that it was a challenge for you to try to figure out what's going to appeal to an American audience. I mean, you're Korean, right? And you're familiar with all these foods. I mean, how did you kind of figure out what might be good for someone who's coming from America or a Western audience? Well, you know, I mean, for me, I, could, I can't speak for everybody who's a Westerner. I can only speak from my experience of growing up in Western culture most of my life. Um, I, you know, I think we just kind of followed our hearts, and I gave Eric ideas, you know, where I go with my family and what appeals to me and uh, what we like to do. So we just, you know, I think it, it was really natural. We did have some story ideas that were given to us. But um, yeah, I mean, we try to keep it as organic as possible. My family is sprinkled throughout. Mm -hmm. My grandmothers and them, my cousins, my uncle, aunts, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, so you visited, you know, um, geographically speaking, I mean, like what areas of, of, Seoul, of Korea did you visit? I saw that you obviously visited Jeju-do and. Yeah, Busan. Uh, Sokcho, where most of my family is, my grandmother, and I have a lot of aunts and cousins there. Where is Sokcho exactly? <coughs> Northeast? Northeast, yeah. Northeast. Right, like 60 miles south of the North Korean South Korea border, so right on the coast. Have you ever been? I've actually never been. Oh, no. you have to go. It's great because you have mountains and then the ocean. So great seafood mm -hmm. coupled with, you know, beautiful mountains and hiking and temples. And it's, I just find it to be really. We even went to Lotte World. I don't know if oh, really? there's, there's footage of Marja on a, ro a roller coaster at Lotte World. <laughs> oh, that roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was a lot of fun. It's called the Viking or something. So we went everywhere. We went, we, went, we went to beaches. We went to mountains, temples. Fish markets. Fish markets. 
in heels. <laughs> we went to nightclubs, we went to Norebang, we went to street food, like Pojang Matcha tents. What was the most uh, memorable Norebang night for you guys? Oh, which one? <laughs> which one? Yeah. Well, from what we remember, um, I think it was uh, after we had been shooting at uh, Pojang. Uh, we went to see um, Lee Young Hee, the hanbok designer, traditional hanbok designer. Um, who I met years ago, ironically, um, and I was in a fashion show of hers in New York with Chloe, and then to, just to be reconnected again through this series was great. But um, we shot there, and then we went to um, Relax. your friend's place. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. So I don't know. Mm. There's a, actually, there's a Norebang in Korea where there's a stage, and there's like lights, and it's like literally if you were performing at the VMAs or something like that, it's that type of environment. And yes. there's an audience, and... It's like, uh, and there's like LCDs in the back and, and uh, Oh, that's very exciting though. I mean, it's, it's not, because what I don't like about Norebang sometimes, it feels very antisocial. You're going to like a small room and on the crowd. the screen, but this is, oh. you're going out there, right? It's a Every now party. and then, but we have enough crew that it feels like we've got an audience. Oh. <laughs> Great. Um, well, uh, about, uh, how about like going through, um, you know, while you're going through Korea and trying all these foods, I mean, you, you mentioned that you're visiting your family at the same time. Um, was that, I mean, do you see your family often? And, like, was this, uh, was, um, how did that kind of add to the experience of, of the Kimchi Chronicles? Well, um, I see my family in Korea, you know, I try and go every year, but it is difficult with everyone's schedule, and you can't just go there for a week. I mean, you need at least two, three weeks. I mean, my mother likes to spend a month, and I used to do a month, but can't do that now. Um, but what made it special was I felt even more at home, and you know, any Korean who has an emo, <laughs> my emo is like a typical Korean emo. I mean, she really took care of me on this trip, and I didn't feel so far from home, because I was traveling a lot by myself um, without our daughter and my husband. So it was great just to see family and have them around. It just felt even more like home. And I saw that one of those uh, trips was to a beach, and you're eating on the beach and everything. That's in Sokcho, yeah. That's in Sokcho? Yeah. What were you eating? Uh, my, my aunt made a crab, um, a spicy crab stew. And then she did some, some samgyeopsal and uh, some, uh, yeah. And was there uh, soju involved, too? or Always. <laughs> <laughs> um... Well, uh, what, were there other, what, what were the more, more uh, kind of uh, adventurous uh, cuisines that you tried out there? And I mean, I, I guess you might have tried, already tried some, um, but I, I saw some great footage there of your husband uh, try. I don't, what was that? Is this long and string? Sea cucumber uh, intestine? A, yeah, in, intestines of a sea cucumber. That's tough. Have you tried that before? Yep. <laughs> he does that. <laughs> <laughs> but I had uh, bondegi which I used oh. to eat when I oh, was right. little. I, I used to eat it all the time. And, you know, I remember that smell. And, you know, we went to the market. We were in Insadong one day. And, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, bondegi is um, silkworm larva. Well, Charlie was like, eat it. I said, well, now I know what it is, you know, and it looks like what it is, and it smells like what it is. Anyway, that was a little tough because I didn't have a she soju. She had her first um, sundae experience in Korea. Sundae was good. That was good yeah. because it was spicy. No, I had had sundae before, but not not from. Uh, sundae is basically, yeah. you know, it's, it's sausage, right? I mean, blood sausage. Silk, yeah, blood sausage, good for hangovers. So mm -hmm. good for, right. Well, <laughs> I have other hangover cures that I take my friends. Actually, this is how I introduced all my friends to Korean food, especially the ones that are kind of skittish or worried that it's too spicy. So we go out and we get drunk, and I just take them to, uh, you know, like the hard, what, where's the, uh, uh, pocha? Pocha? <laughs> pocha. And, you know, especially my friend Nathan, who's in the audience, he'll be like, what is this? And I'll be like, shut up and eat it. And then the next morning, he'll That's call me, and he'll be like, oh my god, I feel great. What was that that we <laughs> ate? And I'm like, see? You know, you just got to close your eyes and eat it sometimes. Uh -huh. But he loves pure jjigae, which is, you know, Pretty hardcore, but that's one of uh, our family's favorite. Yeah, you, if you guys aren't familiar with pude jjigae, it's basically uh, kind of army spicy, stew. yeah, army stew, spicy casserole, whatever you got, just throw it in there and right. and just uh, cook it up with some ramen noodles and, and spam and hot dogs spam. and cheese. Spam, you need cheese. Right, let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, but that that 
that particular chige came about from all the surplus from the military, you know, over time. And uh, Koreans started adapting spam and American cheese and um, different things into, you know, whatever you had at home. But it's a pretty darn good stew. So you are a fan of spam? I love it. Anybody else out there like spam? I, I like it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy. Um, all right. Well, um, I mean, how about for you, Eric? I mean, what did what did you go through when you were, you know, doing the shooting and everything? You know, logging over 400, uh, 200 hours of footage and everything. Like, what what kind of did you? What happened along the way for you? Um, nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> uh, you know, I, my biggest concern is that everybody was safe. You know, I as sort of the person that. I, I, the worst thing that could happen on any shoot is you're getting good footage, and my biggest concern is that every, nobody gets hurt, nobody gets sick, and it's kind of like I'm, I'm like the, the nanny. And uh, tell them I missed my flight. Marja <laughs> missed the flight on the first on the first shoot. She missed her. She said, "I thought the flight was tomorrow." And I said, "No, it's at like 12:50 a.m. today, and you just missed your flight." <sighs> and she's like, oh, "Horrible." Flight, huh? She was like crying. What and, a uh, great. Like, First but impression. It was fine. I built that into the schedule. I miss. I actually <laughs> thought that she would miss her flight, and we were fine. Oh, very, very stop smart it! You did right not. Here. You're your producer. Is your man right here? No, but um, along the journey, the, the, the it was it was an incredible journey to go back to Korea. Um, I've never been there for work or business, um, and you learn a lot by being there versus as being a tourist versus for business. So for me personally, I thought that it was an incredible. Uh, experience just to understand the way Korean people do business, which is different from the way people in America do business. And, and for me, uh, it was an incredible learning experience. Um, and, and at the end of the day, my biggest concern was that everybody got home safe. And, uh, and then hopefully we got the right footage. And, and even, I... <laughs> even getting the footage, and you know, we back up everything twice because we now we, we record onto digital like media, every, you know, these memory cards. And I remember thinking, so do we ship one ahead of time? Do we, how many copies do we make? Do we need to make six copies? Because once that footage is gone, your show's gone. So um, we eventually got the footage back. Um, but you know, those are the concerns I have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's different from what Marja had. Marja just wants My banana uyu on set. Yeah, she wants her <laughs> banana uyu. She wants her ujinga. She wants her, you know, it's, not, it's different concerns. <laughs> right, so we, we talked a little bit about like your experiences uh, on this on this journey. I mean, did you notice uh, some some insights that people that you met, uh, maybe things that they might have learned from from you guys coming coming over and hmm. you know talking to them and, and enjoying the food and everything? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, I think uh, um, I understand. I mean, Korean people. I mean, I'm sure there's some of you here, but. Korean people are all about respect. I think um, as I was doing business, as we go to these stories, and um, what I learned was how important respect is in Korean culture. And it's not necessarily about money or fame or anything else. It's just that I think at the end of the day, Korean people care about respect, respect for what they believe in, with respect for their values. And so whether it's with you know sponsors or with um, your local ajumma who runs a you know panchan stand, it's you have to appreciate what they're trying to do with their lives. And if you can relate to them in some way or another and respect that, then they'll let the, they'll let the cameras in. They'll, they'll open up their lives to you as long as you respect. And that was the biggest thing is you can't. Enthusiasm yeah, for it. enthusiasm yeah. for it. And, <laughs> um, and to me, you know, growing up in, in America, sometimes that, that gets um, dismissed or taken advantage of or mm -hmm. not even you know, considered. But I think in Korea, even now today, it's still about respect. And I think. Um, it was a good reminder back to kind of the roots that my parents taught me that no matter what, you always have to show respect. And whether it's to elders or other people, I think um, when we go and do these stories, the last thing you want is a producer barging into your store or restaurant and saying, oh, we're a TV crew. We can shoot here. No, we're you have to actually, yeah. And <laughs> yeah. what I learned was before you even bring the cameras in, try to understand who they're about and, um, and try to understand their story and then tell them what you're trying to do and communicate that. and then. And then I think that, that, that's what leads to a good TV show, but you'll see later whether that's true or not. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about, uh, so I mean, ob obviously, you know, you were saying that the show is kind of like the first step to uh, promoting uh, Korean food uh, and, and culture, you know, here in the States and everything. 
Um, we're here in New York City where, uh, you know, it's kind of like the place to, to try all these things, to spread these things and see, uh, see what catches and what doesn't. Right. Um, what kind of uh, potential or future do you see for, for Korean food um, here in the city or like, you know, like what do you think, what do you think the possibilities are basically? I think the fact that uh, people eat Indian food on a regular basis and Japanese sushi uh, on a regular basis says a lot about um, you know people being able to adapt to new things. I think it's just a matter of exposing it and people learning about it and um, seeing it and trying it and seeing other people that look like them and that come from the same walks of life eating and trying those things. So mm -hmm. just exposure, exposure, exposure. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, what do you think is uh, are some foods that uh, people can adapt to very quickly? I'm so tired of talking about the barbecue and the bibimbap because I feel like you know I, that's of course it's amazing Korean food, but it's just it's so safe. And you know my thing with Korean food is I can always you know if I've got an ailment, my stomach's not feeling good, or you know I'm feeling a little cold coming on, I know what to eat, and I find that Korean food is medicine for your body, um, in addition to being really tasty and satisfying at the same time. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really excited about this personally because, you know, when you're, when you're walking around thinking about what to eat normally, it's like, what do I eat, like a, a hot dog or a hamburger or, you know, just like french fry, all these things, but like, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I, I love that stuff. I, I absolutely love it, but, you know, if, once you got to eat it like every single day, it kind of wears on you and, Terrible. you know, so... You know, I'm very excited about the possibility of having, you know, a little bit more different kinds of foods, I think, available to us. And, you know, obviously that's very possible here in New York. Right. Um, what do you think about, you know, as far as other parts of the country, do you think um, that, you know, maybe this kind of food can catch on? And, you know, how do we promote food well, to do that? Well, I mean, I, I went to Utah skiing earlier this year, and they had more sushi restaurants than you could imagine. Um, so I think, you know, it's about time. People just need to know where to get the ingredients. I mean, Korean food, I think, is, is simple. It, it takes a lot of time and a lot of care and a lot of love. But um, as long as you have your, your, I mean, what is it, six, seven ingredients that I use for almost everything, um, as long as you can order that online, you can go to your Safeway or Giant or, you know, D'Agostino and buy the ingredients, pretty much. Mm. So I think it's really doable. And, you know, in our household, we've adapted um, a lot of, you know, regular American-style barbecue with Korean flavor, so. And uh, in what, what, do you, what do you do to your American barbecue? Um, well, I'm responsible for the marinade and sauces. He does the grilling, and I do all the, mm -hmm. the sauces. You know. But he doesn't have the patience to stand around and see what I actually do. <laughs> so he just asked me to make it. He can never replicate it. So that's a good thing. And uh, so a lot of these recipes that you came up with, uh, you're, you're putting into your book. That's going to be coming they're, out they're as well. They're all in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what's, uh, what's one uh, kind of you know, teaser recipe or you know, dish from your book that you might be a proud of? Um, one dish that I'm really, really proud of that always comes out really good is um, tak bokum tang, which would be tak, uh, tak duri tang, but oh. that's chicken, chicken. <laughs> so I'm saying it the proper way. Um, but I, I really love that dish. It's it's comforting and it's it's uh, it's kind of like soul food. I always say Korean food is the soul food of Asia. Mm. I just got one question though before we uh, go to the audience. What does uh, silkworm taste like? It tastes like silkworm. <laughs> <laughs> I can't describe it any other way. It tastes like a bug. Or, huh? Was it good or? I just... say no. No. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> okay, I'll take your word for it then. <laughs> All right, so do we have a question from the audience at all? And if you could come to the side. Um, here we go. Oh, no. Hi. My friend. Can you hear me? Um, so it, it appears that there is like a really good mix between, is that on? Who needs? That there's a really good mix between like um, sites that you deliberately sought out, like the kimchi jjigae place, and um, places that were more, um, like by the seat of your pants, right? In the exploration of Korean food and the culinary landscape, was that something that you deliberately tried to seek a balance of, or is that something that you just? Definitely. Yeah, I think um, 
anytime we do these shows, or you know, in general, when you go to a country, um, half the food in the travel guides is it's kind of it's not good. Um, so if you if we if we went by, you know, those travel guides, I don't think we would have found the stories. Um, the other half of the stories, I think, come from meeting people, um, getting recommendations, finding people that have been to these restaurants for years, and so. I think it's an organic process of let's find a good balance of what's commercial and also what's what's organic and what's you know authentic and I think we hit a good balance but um, between tourist touristic places that you know Americans who've never had a Korean food can go to and then kind of the hole in wall places that if you already know Korean food that this is like the next level mm -hmm. the next level up like the you know silkworm lava you know it just there's some some food that we sought out to say, you know, what would Americans first want to try when they come to Korea? And then there's that food that, you know, what would even Korean people want to try, even though they may not necessarily be familiar with some of these locations, so. Mm -hmm. Next question. Now, I know a lot of people here are meat eaters. I am not. I am a vegan. <laughs> and I absolutely love kimchi and have found a world of wonderful eating in uh, Korean food. So. Did any of your uh, investigations follow some of what's all n tradition? There's a lot of, of course, monk food and so forth that is there that may not be so spicy, but also a lot of uh, modern Koreans are leaning that way. A lot of organic uh, farms. Was there anything addressed in your series by that? Uh, we went to um, Sanchon. Sanchon. We did. A, we have an episode dedicated to kind of vegetarian and temple cuisine. Um, one of the episodes is about going to, we, we went to the temples and we did, you know, kind of what people do at temples in terms of praying and, and showing that aspect. But we also went to temple cuisine restaurants where um, you kind of see the history and um, kind of why people believe what they do. And, you know, monks usually in, in Korea, they, 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 their temples are in mountainous regions. So a lot of the food that they make is, is, is kind of mountain vegetables and herbs. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of see and understand, you know, their philosophy on food, and you know, they don't even use garlic sometimes because it's too pungent. Pungent, but also there's no. I don't know how to say it correctly, but in in Buddhism, there's no. You don't eat food for its flavor. You eat it for its nutrition, and so um, therefore, if it tastes good, it, it's almost against kind of the values of Buddhism. But um, it, it's really for nutrition because you know they, they want to take care of. The plants and stuff like that. So we did a, we did some stuff in in um, in, Bud in Buddhist cuisine and things like that. Oh man! Hi Eric. Hi Margin. <laughs> Hi Key. Hi. I'm only asking this question because I knew the answer. But what was the coolest day on the shoot <laughs> for both of you? You go first. I want to hear this. <laughs> there was um we were in Jejudo. Um, and uh, we did a episode at you see you see a little bit of the five, there's a five day market it's a market in Korea in Jeju-do that only happens every five days, um, and there was we weren't going to do anything except just feature the five day market but um, uh, Jean George was exploring and kind of figuring out you know what get, he'd never been in a Korean market before and I remember he said I I can't do his French accent but he said you know I have to cook tonight I see all these ingredients and so oh, right. Um, that day, we uh, it was an, it was it was nice for several reasons, but we basically went to the location, shot it, went to another location, then went back to the market to pick up groceries, and I went grocery shopping, and we bought all this amazing seafood um, from Jeju-do, and John George and his friend Magnus cooked a, a dinner for just the crew and Marja and, and everybody, just not not for TV, just because he wanted to, and uh, and and that was one of the most memorable experiences, just because it was. It wasn't planned by anybody except um, John George, and and, at the, and we shot it kind of in the kitchen, which will be part of the behind the scenes stuff. But it's basically John George's friend Chloe cooking in the kitchen for the entire crew, and it was almost kind of like a relaxing day, yet getting a taste of Korean food um, in a different way. So, what did he cook, by the way? What is it? He did a uh, langoustine with a uh, gochujang mayo dipping sauce. He did, uh, you know, he did that uh, cabbage saute with uh, fresh, I think red snapper from local red snapper. And then he made um, a mushroom saute, and um, and it was just it was, it tasted good. It was pretty yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> it was all right. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs>
Not as good as yours. Right? Yeah, I don't know what your favorite, what was your favorite you day. People. <laughs> what was your favorite day? Huh? What was your favorite day? My favorite day. I think my favorite day was um, when I was in Sokcho. The, the scene that you saw on the beach um, with the singing are my aunt and my cousin and my grandmother. Um, so just to be able to see them all and spend some time because our schedule is really, really crazy. But um, just to spend the day there and have my aunt make my favorite stew was great. Mm. That was a pretty magical day. Her grandmother, I remember, was waiting in the van just for this one moment so we can capture it on TV. And hours. Two hours she was waiting for our crew to wow. set up. And I felt bad. She was in a hanbok. And if you saw the orange hanbok, she was patiently with She didn't say anything, you know. She didn't say, you know, when are you guys going to be ready? She just, <laughs> just kind of, she just kind of said, waited. You. Well, she kind of <laughs> waited. And, um, and then finally we, we got to the beach and it was her family her, you know, nephew, you know, ne was it nephew, cousins, and mm -hmm. basically just a regular picnic on the beach. And anybody who's Korean and anybody who's, you know, American definitely understands how important grandmothers are. And for us to capture that moment and feature it in the show is probably one of the most important elements of the show for us and for Marja and to, to tell her story. So that was second most important to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good evening. I'd won the first. Firstly, congratulate you on such a wonderful first episode. Thank I you. presume all the other ep episodes will just be as exciting. Two quick questions. Number one, how many places do you think you visited during the production of the... Gosh. I'd say that about, about a dozen different places um, throughout Korea. Um, <coughs> if you consider Seoul one place, there's probably 11 other cities we went to. Uh, whether we got B-roll there or you know main footage there or stories there, but I would say about 12 different places. And my second question, which may be a little controversial, did you deal with some of the foods that people eat in tradition in Korea, which most Western people wouldn't think um, as appropriate to eat? <laughs> huh. <laughs> like, well, I mean, you mean in the cookbook or on the no, show? No, in, in, in the show or in your cookbook or in. Um, well, I think one one particular food that kind of stands out that isn't really that common in Korea even is ojingo sundae, right? Um, which I replicated in the book. But it's delicious. It's amazing, but it's just, it's kind of famous. It's, it's a North Korean. It's a stuffed, it's a stuffed, stuffed a calamari. It's stuffed calamari, which you cut it up and then you fry it. Um, but it's stuffed it's, with rice. It's stuffed with and rice like, and vegetables, and yeah. it's really good. Um, I can tell you, I mean, one of the th stories that didn't make the cut was eating live octopus. I mean, we really... I went to Busan, and the first time I was sitting at this restaurant, and they brought all this moving food, and I just <laughs> I said, I don't know if Marge is really going to eat this. And so you were actually going to try and make me eat that. <laughs> <laughs> so we cut out live octopus out of the show because I wouldn't eat it. Marge wouldn't eat it. And other, dom <laughs> and other domestic animals, I presume, too, right? No, 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 no nothing like that. Oh, no, there's no. no dog or anything in the, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it'll fly here. <laughs> Hi, um, this question is for Marja. I was just wondering, um, actually, my sister-in-law is adopted as well. And oh. so when she, f before she was adopted, her mother went to a Korean market and bought kimchi. And she opened it, and she thought it was rotten, so she just threw it away. Really? So, I mean, when you first came to, I guess, to the United States and when you were growing up, was it was Korean food introduced to you like after college or when you're in college or even when you were with your family here in the um, US? I did not grow up eating it. Mm -hmm. Although my father, I didn't know this at the time, but uh, my father would always go to this Chinese restaurant, which I didn't know was Korean Chinese. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he would always order noodles mm -hmm. with black bean sauce, okay. which I later found out uh -huh. was cha jangmyeon, which uh -huh. is one of my favorite things to eat when I was little. Mm -hmm. um, so I would always, whenever he went, I would always ask him to get me some noodles with mm -hmm. black bean sauce. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I would see kimchi every now and then in the supermarket and I would buy it, but I kind of felt guilty in a way, wanting to know this part of my life that mm -hmm. was now so foreign. I don't know. I, I guess you kind of have to be an adoptee to understand mm -hmm. that you have your own guilt, mm -hmm. even with your own, you know, family that's raised you. Mm -hmm. Um, but my main exposure came was when I found my birth mother oh. and, um, she started introducing me to lots of different Korean foods, and I remembered the taste. So okay. uh -huh. now there's a name for the taste. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. 안녕하세요. 감사합니다. Um, for me, I started cooking Korean food in 1973. Wow. 
And I think you're at the perfect storm. By the way, I, I, whenever I see Neil Shapiro, I beg him to show Korean dramas. I said, oh, I, I man. will even do the subtitles for oh, you. Me too, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but for me, it's an inroad, but, so I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I think it's the perfect storm because you talked about hamburgers and hot dogs. That is not traditional American fare. That came after World War II, the fast food. So we are moving back. So you have that to to guide Americans in. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I, it's not a commercial. I don't know Mr. H Mart very, very well. But mm -hmm. when I first started cooking Korean food, um, I didn't know where to buy sesame oil. Mm -hmm. So I did it with corn oil. And I didn't know where to get perennial leaves, so I used lettuce leaves. And I didn't have any kimchi, so I used sauerkraut because I'm half German. Yeah. But <laughs> and what I produced was good food, but not Korean food by any means. And I think now that changes it because I can buy gochujang anytime I want. Right. You know. And I think, and also with H Mart, they are unlike American supermarkets because American supermarkets are regional. Right. You can't find Pathmark where you find Piggly Wiggly. Right. But H Mart is across the country. So did you find that? Americans are now very interested in Korean food because it is more, more yeah, more accessible. And also that they are no longer eating fast food but healthier food. They are thinking before. Mm. Yeah, I, I think the tide's definitely changing. Um, I just feel like, go ahead. There's, um, I mean, not, not that just H Mart is a sponsor of the series, <laughs> but I have to say that H Mart is one of the first um, even supermarkets out there that offers a lot of their ingredients online. And so mm -hmm. our website's actually going to work with their website to make sure that mm -hmm. any of the recipes that, that Marja invented can, can be ordered online, really, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really uh, 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 with one mm -hmm. click. Um, now, aside from that, I think, you know, you see going to Dean and DeLuca nowadays, you go into any Whole Foods, you see kimchi mm -hmm. being sold, you see sesame oil in the way that Koreans eat it, not sesame oil in the non-toasted version, but you see the toasted yeah, sesame yeah. oil. And so those, yeah. thi those little subtleties, I think mm. people are recognizing. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I still think we're not there yet, but I think through people like you who <laughs> request it, we'll, we'll get there. And I think if um, everybody can go to the local store and request those types of things, it might you know, make a difference. So. Marjorie, my kimchi story is I make my own kimchi, and kimchi. I had it a little too long in the refrigerator, and I asked my Irish husband, um, do you think this is bad? And he said, how would you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> well, thank you. And Eric, can you tell us how we can see the series beginning, what, this Sunday, right? Um, yeah, so starting this Sunday, um, this episode that you already just saw will be airing 4 p.m. on Channel 13. I think I only have Time Warner. Ch on Time Warner Channel 713, it's shown in high definition. And uh, every Sunday at 4 o'clock, we'll show it. And then um, nationally, we're going to release the series in July. Um, and that'll be kind of nationwide. You can tell your friends about it. And then we'll offer it online, iTunes, and uh, eventually a DVD, cookbook. That comes out in August. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of broadcast it internationally starting the end of this year um, into markets that want the want the show but um, Sundays for now um, WNET and then WLIW is another PBS station in this market but you know if if you're not from New York there's other PBS stations you can tell your parents and friends about but that that's July for now we're doing an early release on <laughs> Sunday and I mean hopefully you you'll, you'll like it to watch it again but this Sunday and then the second episode um, the Sunday after so every week yeah. Um, everyone can catch it. Wonderful. And Marsha will be back with us for a preview of the cookbook in July. Uh, and then we'd like to invite you all back on Thursday, May 12th, when we'll be doing an evening with My Korean Deli, which is a wonderful new book out. So thank you. And please, a round of applause for Marsha and for Eric and for David. Thank you. <coughs>